Ken, are you better? I'm going to live. Sometimes it feels that way, right? <clears throat> We'll get going in just a second, but let's uh let's say our uh folk of prayer and then we'll and then we'll start. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we're thankful for this evening that you've given us to come and and learn more from your word. We're thankful for those who can be here, we're mindful of those who cannot. We pray for their healing. We pray for um, for you to, to cover us all with your, your grace and your protection. And, and Father, your comfort through these uh, difficult, frustrating times. It seems that um, there are many people sick at once and in many different places. And we pray that you help us get through this. And, and Father, help us to, to come together again in a full assembly. But help us to stay encouraged. Thank you for your word that's able to do just that. Thank you for this avenue of prayer that we can come to you and be reminded of who you are, the great and almighty God who's in control of all things. We're thankful for the, the, the holy word that you have provided to us through your Holy Spirit. We, we ask you to help us to understand and as we look and study it, to apply these truths to our lives and to have a better appreciation of your of your your plan of salvation for us. And I'm thankful for that, for the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. And even when we are weak, Father, and you are there with your, your grace, your comfort, you make us strong. We're thankful for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Book of Isaiah, I have books, and they're big books in the back. I didn't know how many to expect in the class. I, I waited to put them out um, to see how many would be at the class. Um, and uh, you'll notice it's a thick book, but it covers all of the major prophets. And this is technically an overview study. And just to give you an idea of how much of an overview, the first lesson covers the first 23 chapters. Isaiah. And it, it took me a long time to read the first 23 chapters of Isaiah. But don't worry. Um, today, we're not going to get that far. We're going to get mainly through the introduction and through some of the questions um, in your lesson book. And you'll have plenty of time to, to look at the, uh, the workbook before we, we get too, too far. And we'll do our best to stay within the schedule of this book. But um, it, it is supposed to be an overview. There are studies that are supposed to be designed for more detail. Um, this is not going to be one of those studies. I think it's appropriate sometimes to get an overview of the books, to get an understanding of the, the total uh, message, and then go back in at another time, another study, and look at it more detail. But, um, We'll do the best we can. Well, I'll just put it at that. And uh, but Isaiah is the first in this line of the the major prophets that we are going to go through, and we're going to go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, and Lamentations because that's attached to Jeremiah in this study. Um, Ezekiel and Daniel. Okay. Um, so Isaiah. Is uh, what are some of the anybody know any of the nicknames that are given to Isaiah? He's one of the major what kind of prophets? Uh, major. He's one of the major prophets. He's one of the major prophets, but what kind of prophet? Messianic. Messianic prophet. Okay. There's a lot of prophecies about Jesus in, in the book of Isaiah, and very uh, detailed in his. Uh, his, his prophecies, and we'll, we'll go over some of those through the book, but the book of Isaiah begins the section of the Old Testament called the prophets. 
Okay. Major prophets and minor prophets. Who can tell me why they're major prophets? The length of the book. That's right, because they're big books, yeah. not because they're important. Uh, they are important. They're all important, but not uh, for any other reason than that they just occupy a lot of space in your uh, Old Testament. Um, he is the first of the major prophets. Uh, he has been called the dean of the prophets. And so um, let's talk a little bit about who Isaiah was as a, a man. So the very first verse in Isaiah introduces uh, him to us, and he is the son of Amos. Uh, Amos with a Z, not an S. It's a different Amos, but it's pronounced the same. Amos. Uh, his wife was also a prophetess, and you find that in chapter 8 and verse 3. And he has two sons in verse 3 of chapter 7. It introduces them, and also, and, and this is his one of his sons has the longest name of any of the any of the names in the entire Bible, and one of his sons named Maher Shalal Hashbaz. So I can't even remember how to say it. I have to look at it. Uh, Maher Shalal Hashbaz is the name of one of his sons. Um, just interesting. Uh, he wrote more than just the book of Isaiah, okay? Um, Second Chronicles has reference to other um, material that he was, uh, he can. And there is a tradition that says that he is the one that was referred to in Hebrews 11.37, possibly, as the one who was psalm in two. Tradition says he was sawn in two with a wooden saw at the king at the command of King Manasseh. Uh, Hebrews eleven thirty seven talks about uh, some uh, various people who suffered, and one of those in verse thirty seven says, "Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two." They were tempted, they were slain with the sword. So he could have been the guy who was Solomon II. Um, that's a tradition. We don't know if that's who the Hebrew writer was referring to, um, definitely or not. So that is the hymn. Um, that we don't know a whole lot about who he is or who he was, except for tradition and what the, the word of God says. And that's pretty much what we know about him as a man. Now, as far as the time and date of his work, um, his uh, tenure, I guess, as a, uh, his coverage is between 740 and 700 B.C., and he covers the period of four kings, okay, which that uh, it names here in the first paragraph of, of Isaiah in your Bible. Um, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And what do you notice, first of all, about that list? What's peculiar about it? That on one hand, there's Ahaz. Uh -huh. And then there's Hezekiah. Can you imagine being a prophet under uh, Ahaz? Who's Ahaz married to? Jezebel. And that's got to be a frightening thing, because she hated she hated uh, the, the wow. Jews um, and the prophets. And then on the other side, there's Hezekiah. You know? And so there is a lot of experience in, in Isaiah's life in the, just the 40 years that he um, the, the book covers. He was a contemporary with Micah. Who, who prophesied between 735 and 700 in the southern kingdom. Um, remember at this time there's Israel, the northern kingdom, 
And then there's the, the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, during the same period, Amos prophesied in the northern kingdom between 760 and 750 B.C., and Hosea also in the northern kingdom between 750 and 725 B.C. So on a, a timeline, it kind of gives you an idea of when um, Isaiah lived. Um, he, there are, as we're going to go through the prophets, there are some who lived before the exile, and there are some who lived during the exile, um, and then there are, you know, various ones um, kind of here and there, but these, these prophets lived um, during the same time, at, at least one point during their lives, they prophesied at the same time. Uh, he was, this is Isaiah, about 150 years before Babylonian captivity. Um, it won't be too much longer that Israel, the northern kingdom, is taken captive uh, by uh, Assyria. But as far as Babylon, this is well before Babylonian captivity. And it's important to understand that when you look at some of the prophets, uh, prophecies that he makes about captivity um, and how, how far before he actually prophesied that it would, it would happen. The message of the book First of all, the background. The, the background addresses a time of prosperity that brought on spiritual and moral decay. Um, the, the dominant threat of his day was Syria. Okay, and during the Book of Isaiah, you can see how prosperity and fatness as he says, um, causes inner spiritual decay, causes people to uh, forget the Lord and not be prepared, uh, not be strong. It makes people weak. Um, uh, money is, uh, or prosperity was uh, abundant in the land during these, these years. And so people were uh, living happy, but as far as their, their moral side, it was very weak, and worship was very weak. And so that is what Isaiah uh, has to um, preach during in his time. He's a prophet to the southern kingdom. Now, the message of the book. Now, a man named H.C. Leopold says that the message is Yahweh's sovereignty. Um, there are two major thoughts in this book. In chapters 1 through 39, the major theme is chastening the spiritual state of Judah, its sin, and what, what it was doing wrong. And then what was going to happen because of that? The, impend the impending Assyrian invasion. Um, they didn't rely on the Lord anymore. Uh, and then the second half of the book, chapters 40 through 66, um, consolation. Okay? So he goes all the way through um, captivity, and then the, he, he looks past it to the hope. And this is where a lot of the Messianic prophecies are written because he begins to look a lot further forward to the ultimate victory that's found in Christ. And he, uh, it's, it's heavily messianic, okay? Messianic is just a word that comes from the word Messiah, and Messiah means what? The Savior. Savior, right? Savior. Messiah is the one, the prophesied one uh, in Jesus who is going to come save his people from their sins. Okay? That's why he's Messiah. 
Um, so it's messianic because it talks a lot about the Messiah. Um, now Isaiah is an extremely important book for building your faith in, in Jesus in the New Testament. It's a very important book in um, what we call apologetics. Um, not saying you're sorry, but proving the truths of the Bible. Um, the Bible is its best proof of itself. And so when we look at books like Isaiah with its prophecies, and then you see the fulfillment of those prophecies one by one over, over time, heavily prophesied about Jesus and how uh, a lot of the things that Jesus uh, fulfilled in, in those prophecies, it, it builds up your faith and it, it causes you to have a better appreciation of the overall theme of the Bible, even the, the Old Testament, because the, you know, the Old Testament points, you know, to the New Testament. It points to Jesus. And you can find um, the path that, that God has made all the way to the New Testament, especially in the prophets. And so it's one of my, my favorite Old Testament books. It's one of the longest Old Testament books that you'll read, um, aside from the Psalms. Okay, it's a pretty heavy read. That's why this is an overview. But read the whole thing if you can. I mean, it, it probably wouldn't take you that long if you read it up um, a little bit every day to get through the book. But just read through the prophets um, as we go along, um, and you'll get a lot uh, out of it. And a lot of the study, even as we go through the, the main themes um, and messages and, uh, and events of, of Isaiah. So um, there's an outline that you want to go through in this. It's a very basic outline. This is adapted from Homer Haley's book on Isaiah and others. First 39 chapters covers the judgment uh, from God, the Assyrian period, the conflict of, of that period, and the victory. But in that, there's a prophecy made against Judah and Jerusalem. There's a prophecy against the nations in chapters 13 through 23. There's a list of nations that are um, condemned in this book. The world judgment and deliverance of God's people. Even though the world has been judged, there's a remnant that still worships God. This is a, a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible, um, even in the New Testament. Um, and then, of course, woes against the sins of the people, um, not just the nation, but the people of the nation. Historical interlude concerning Hezekiah in chapters 36 and 39. It's an interesting interlude. If you read chapters 36 and 39, you find a lot of the same uh, information that you find in um, Second Kings about Hezekiah. Um, so it, you know, it lines up historically. Then the victory over Assyria in chapters 36 and 37. Um, Judah's sin with Babylon. And then in chapters 40 through 40, uh, 66, you have comfort from God and then hope for the, the trouble and then the remnant returning, okay? Um, so he goes through the whole post-exile prophecy. Deliverance from Babylon, chapters 40 and 40 through 48. The suffering servant, um, 49 through 57 is another section that you really need to pay attention to, especially chapter 53, um, because this is where the Jews didn't really understand when Jesus was on earth about how the Messiah is the same as the suffering servant that was prophesied in Isaiah 53. And to the Jews, in, during Jesus' time, he was going to be this the Messiah that was prophesied as the victor, the warrior on the throne of David, but they didn't see, they couldn't see the other prophecies and understand that it was also the Messiah that was 
going to die and suffer and redeem by his blood the sins of the people who becomes um, the uh, the intercessor as Isaiah says for the transgressors okay so this is an important combination in, in one person not just the victor's victorious warrior but how was he victorious not exactly how the Jews thought he would be um, so the suffering servant is important and then the future glory in chapters 58 through 66 um, yeah, we're going to talk about that uh, in, a, in a few weeks, but that is the uh, the outline of the book. Key verse that summarizes the book, and there's a lot of verses, but that chapter 31 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Um, it's a fatal mistake for a man to place his hope in man and not in God. And when they do, um, then they are doomed to failure and destitute, uh, destitution uh, because they they have to rely on and seek on seek the Lord. So when we look at Isaiah, as we start out, um, the first 23 chapters, okay, the point of this section against the nations okay so not only is judgment made on the city of God and the promised land and the people of God but also the whole basically the whole land the whole world God is making judgment on um, it's everybody it's not just one person or one nation it's everybody who has sinned. It's, it's Israel who has sinned because they have uh, left the Lord and relied on the nations, and then it's the nations who sin because of their idolatry and their immorality, um, and, and they're carrying Judah off with it. And you can see when we look at these prophecies that even though Babylon physically carried off Judah, spiritually they were carried off well before they were carried off physically, okay? But that was the natural, uh, you know, progression of, of that sin is eventually, if they didn't repent, then they would be carried off to Babylon, okay? And then when we look at the prophecy against Judah and Jerusalem, in verse 1, Right off the bat, it says, In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Okay? And then it goes on through the next many verses and describes Judah's sin. Judah has forsaken God. Um, they are called in verse 2 Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and have brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So, rebellious children, and that is who is being condemned here, are the ones who turned against the Father. You know, the one, the Father who had nurtured them and had given them a land that had um, given them kings and had given them uh, worship 
and his protection and his guidance and his word, and they left <laughs> all of that to fat in their bellies, um, and they relied on uh, other nations. In verse 4, they said, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, um, overloaded with sin. Laden is what you do to a donkey, right? Uh, whenever you pack it up and you put all these bags, you know, you see a pack mule and you can see, you know, you can kind of envision just all that weight. Um, that's the sin that was on Judah. They were overloaded with sin, okay? It wasn't just those sin, it was they were overloaded. So the picture is they were full of sin, all right? They were um, all, all together wicked. And it was, it's not painting a very pretty picture about the, the condition of Judah. As a matter of fact, it says, um, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faints, in verse 5, from the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in from the top of their head to the tips of their toes. They are sinful, right? So it paints a picture of, of just how how sinful they are. And not only are they sinful, but their worship is corrupt. In verses ten through fifteen, uh, they are going through the motions of worship, but they're they're not clean on the inside, right? And so they're just acting like they're righteous. They're bringing their offerings before the Lord, but he doesn't accept their offerings because they're not brought by, you know, any good intention. Um, it does no good, as it says in verse 11. What purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord, I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Now he's talking about their sacrifices because of their spiritual sickness. Okay, they, they have not repented of their sins. They're full from head to, head to toe of sins, and yet they're still trying to go worship God. And he, he can see their hearts, he can see their intentions. And he calls them out on it. He's sick of it. He says in verses 11 through 15, and he will not accept it. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. They're presumptuous, right? They're sinful. They're presumptuous. And do they even believe in God? If they believe in God, do they think they're hiding their sinfulness from him? Um, they can't hide anything. And so this judgment is upon them, even though they're oblivious. And Isaiah is condemning this. They're oblivious to their own sin. Um, and so what verses 16 through 20 now, after this calling out, um, in verse 16, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the oppressor, the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. So judgment awaits in verses 21 through 31. Because Judah has changed. It, it's ugly, he says in verse 21, how the faithful city has become a harlot. And it's that's a that's a terrible thing to say. You know, it has become a uh, an adulterous nation. Okay, they're running to other uh, other nations and other things. He says it was full of justice, righteousness, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Um, who knows what dross is? It's a waste. Okay, when you refine silver, all the stuff that comes off of it, the impurities, whenever it's refined, all that's the, the dross, right? 
all the, the stuff you just throw away and it's no good for anything okay and so that's the the picture that um, is being painted about Judah but because of this God will bring judgment that purges the draws in verses 24 through 31 um, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies who are his enemies in verse 25 I will turn my hand against you that's Judah I will I will thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all of your alloy okay he's getting rid of the dross not to destroy the city but to purify it okay just like again the picture of, of precious metal being purified by fire is exactly how Judah is going to be purified and then what's going to be left over he goes on to say I will restore your judges at the first so justice is going to return and your counselors at the beginning so wisdom is going to return and afterward you shall be called the city of righteousness the faithful city so righteousness and faithfulness will return after the Lord purifies Judah through this process right um, and so when we look at chapters 2 through 4 you have kind of a, a comparison between um, the future of, of Jerusalem and the present Jerusalem the sinful state that it was in now this is the chapters 2 through 4 so you have a, an introduction to the future Jerusalem in the first four verses of chapter 2 and let's read what it says here the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem and shall come to pass in the latter days okay now the latter days are going to be a familiar term because the prophets will use those whenever it concerns the end of this judgment and then the establishment of something else. Daniel uses the latter days in those days whenever he uses the prophecy to talk about the, the kingdom of God being established, okay? In the latter days, that is, after all of this is over, okay? In the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, the nations shall flow to it. Um, again, you have kind of the same image that Daniel is going to paint in other prophets when it talks about in the, uh, in the prophecy that Daniel made to Nebuchadnezzar when the kingdom appears, it's going to be like a mountain, right? And it is going to encompass and destroy uh, all of the other kingdoms, all right? And the mountain, when we talk about a mountain, what are some features about a mountain that are significant when it comes to the, the exaltation of uh, the Lord's kingdom? The mountain is so large, it's majesty over, over, over the whole country. You know, they be on top of the mountain, you know, you just way up there. That's right. It, it's overwhelming as far as the, the scene is concerned. It's bigger than everything. Okay, it covers everything. Um, you, you look at it, and uh, it, it's higher than the cities, it's higher than the hills. Um, it should impress upon you just um, kind of the greatness of God. And the mountains shall be exalted above the hills, and the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come forth the wall. So we have a little better picture of what kind of mountain he's talking about here, specifically. Whenever Jerusalem is reestablished, okay, and it's, it's reestablished as a righteous city, and the people go to it, and they flow to it. Come, let's worship the Lord, and the temple practices are reestablished, not like the current state where they go to the temple, but it's all show and hypocrisy, 
and they're sinful. There is going to be a time, Isaiah says in this prophecy, that it's going to be true. It's going to be where it says, he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. Okay. There is an image here that we like to use. He shall judge between the nations. He shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Um, that could talk about, as some people say, a point in time beyond this time, right? Okay. Or it could be the end of the current conflict that Jerusalem is going to experience and Judah is going to experience when they go into captivity and they finally return back to their land, you know, after, after captivity. War is over and you have this image of peace and then you have this image of prosperity and um, so on and so forth. But the difference is neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay. So there, there's a future of hope, is what I says. Uh, but present Jerusalem in chapter 2, 5, verses uh, through chapter 4 and verse 1, it, it's a little more uh, destitute. Okay. The situation is a little worse, uh, a lot worse, completely opposite, if you will, than the future Jerusalem. All right. It's, it's supposed to paint the picture. Whenever you compare how glorious and righteous and truthful the future Jerusalem is going to be, it even impresses upon you more just how sinful and wrong um, and unrighteous the present Jerusalem is. Um, for example, materialism and forgetting God, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I'm shouting because of the rain. I apologize. Um, pride and idolatry. Selfish leaders, immoral women, you know, and you have this picture of everybody gets to do what they want, and nobody can tell them otherwise, right? There's no order. God's order doesn't exist. Um, the respect and sanctity of marriage is in danger, and you have Every religion under the sun is accepted. The, the leaders are corrupt. All they want to do is please the people and stay in their current position and power. And everybody is living life comfortably, right? And whenever that happens, people turn away from their creator and they turn into themselves and then you have the situation that we have with, with Judah in these chapters. But the future Jerusalem in chapter 4, again, we're reminded in verses 2 through 6, In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Okay? So, you know, this prophecy is supposed to inform us of the current state of Jerusalem, but remind us that, you know, although there's judgment coming, there's also a hope. You know, there's also, the Lord has, because of his promises, uh, he is not going to forget his people. So we'll continue uh, right there um, next week. I appreciate it.